got a question for you as I began. My name is Aaron. I'm the pastor of Shenanigans and Situations here at Cornerstones. And, uh, but I got a question for you. What are you looking for? Did you come this morning? What are you looking for? Bagels, all right. Let's just talk about this. What are you guys looking for? Just shout it out. Inspiration, Inspiration all right. Hope. Jesus. In the Gospel of John, Jesus doesn't say anything until we move into this section where the first words that he says as these guys are falling around and he turns around and he says these words to him. What are you looking for? He begins his entire ministry in the Gospel of John. The writer of John starts by Jesus asking a question to two individuals. And what he does is it makes this, instead of there's a pitch to a bunch of people, he contextualizes it to the people he's talking to. And so this morning, could you imagine Jesus saying to you, what is it you're looking for? You know, as those uh, ragtag bunch of individuals gathered in the wilderness following John the Baptist, or as his rap name was, JTB, uh, around. They were out there in the wilderness, and they were looking for something. Some of them were looking for purpose. Some of them were looking to belong to something bigger than themselves, significance, safety. And this is something that, for me, has kind of haunted me all my life of going, you know what, I'm looking for something, and I just don't quite know what it is yet. And oftentimes, as I boil it down, there are two things that I'm constantly looking for in life, and that's purpose and that's significance. Am I the only one in the room that's looking for purpose, that wants to live a life of purpose? I don't want to just exist, but I want my life to matter. But I don't want it just to matter. I want it to have significance. 127 years ago, my wife and I, after we were just married, moved from Redding, California to the grand metropolis of Ashland, Ohio. Ashland, Ohio is in between Cleveland and Columbus, and it's the heart of Amish country. And so after my wife, who is from Orange County, California, after we got married, we made the trek, and her first day pulling into Ashland, her new place with her new husband, she didn't have a husband before this, I was her first, I, we're st still the same one, S still together. She's been gone most of the summer, but... Still together, awesome. Brought her coffee mug just so she felt close to her. But we pulled into the town, Ashland, Ohio, and right in front of her, an Amish buggy and a wagon train came out because they were having Western days in Ashland, Ohio. And my wife just began to weep. What have I done to deserve this? And then talking to me, what have I done to deserve you? <laughs> But we moved to this place that was really interesting. And we had moved there so that we could both go into graduate school. She was studying to be a clinical counselor. I was going to seminary because it deferred my loans. That's how much of a motivation I had to get back into school. was either start paying, get a job, or go back into grad school and defer those loans for a little longer. So I went to seminary. And as I'm in seminary, I'm with all of these individuals. I had been hired uh, to be the worship leader at a church, and I'm with all of these men and women in the early 2000, late 19, 1999, early 2000, and all of these individuals fancied themselves to be the next pastors of the megachurch that was going to take the country by storm. Or they were going to be professors at these high academic institutions, and then there was me. The only reason they let me in is my dad worked for the seminary, and they said, well, Terry's a nice guy. I guess we got to let Aaron in. So I go into seminary, and I'm sitting there going, you know what? Everybody seems to know what their purpose is. What's mine? I know I'd like to sing, but these people all have these grand plans and these grand purposes, and I wish I did. I'm not quite sure yet. And as I was preparing it was my second year in seminary. We had to take a preaching class, and I was terrified because I was a singer, kind of, but not a preacher. My dad's a preacher, and I got to take this preaching class. 
And I got to get up in front of a professor who is known throughout the eastern seaboard as one of the, the best preachers around. This gigantic African-American man, um, Marvin McMickle, when he spoke, you just like, he'd read the phone book and you're like, praise the Lord. You just like, you were filled with the unction of the spirit as he was reading the phone book. And then these other people that were great preachers and I'm going, I, this is going to be awful. But what happened in this really interesting moment, in this unique time, as I'm sitting in my garage trying to decide on a passage of scripture to try to preach on, the Lord would apprehend my life and bury me in a passage of scripture that then would become the purpose for my life and the significance for my life for the last 20 years. And it's amazing on how he sneaks up on us. And says, I don't want to make this just about a job, but I want to offer you a purpose with significance. And so he gave me this passage. But before I go to that, let's pray. Forgive me for my rambling, Lord. Please Speak your will and speak your words, and whether of you stay and what's of me may be quickly, quickly forgotten. May this be a call to a life lived with you. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Continuing the gospel of John, as I'm sitting in my garage wondering what am I going to preach on, the Lord said, I'm not going to give you a sermon, but what I'm going to give you is your life purpose. And it's going to come by looking at the life of John the Baptist. If you move into the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 22 through 36, and I'll read a section of this. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into Judea countryside and remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing because water was plentiful there and the people were coming and being baptized. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. And all are going to him. And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Listen to that again. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him or her from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I have said, I am not the Christ, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, the joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, and I must decrease. Within this passage, John is saying, this is who I am, this is my purpose in life, and this is my significance. You've heard it said over and over again, I'm not the Messiah. JTB is saying, guys, I may be the first prophet that's on the scene in 400 years of silence, but I'm not the one you're waiting for. I'm simply the friend of the bridegroom who's letting you know he's on his way. John the Baptist knows that he is the friend of the bridegroom and that the bride belongs to the groom and the groom belongs to the bride. And it's all about the two of them and not about him. And he says he must increase, meaning the groom, and I must decrease. And within this imagery, John presents for us a purpose for our lives. And what I would say to you and for myself is I would like to invite you, whether you are an educator whether you are uh, in business, whether you're in technology, whatever, you're a stay-at-home parent, whether you're in school, whatever it is, I would like to invite you to incredible adventure of being the friend of the bridegroom. A greater purpose even than the occupation you may have. John is using this imagery that's really profound because it has so many different layers of culture on it. We're going to unpeel that for a second if you're okay with that. In the Jewish context, as John would have been speaking, the Jewish uh, listeners and readers, they would have heard this and they would have understood. Oh, I understand a wedding situation. There's a person 
who works and represents on behalf of the groom and on behalf of the bride, and they do the negotiation between the two parties. Because marriage wasn't just for love of like, you're my soulmate, you're the one that I was meant for, you complete me. That's not what he's talking about. Many times in the Jewish culture, almost every time, it was an arranged marriage. And the parents would say, this man for this woman. And they would arrange the marriage. And they would go back and forth and there would be a dowry. The groom's parents or the groom would pay a dowry, which was an amount of money to say, when I take your daughter from your home, this is how much you will lose in possible income and work. So I'm going to give you a gift. And there would be a contract that would be signed. It was a binding legal agreement. And then they would wait a period of time and they would have a marriage celebration and a wedding ceremony and they would consummate the marriage. In the Greek culture, it was a little more similar to our contemporary culture where there would be a ceremony. It would be a legal agreement. They had to be both citizens, Roman citizens, were to be approved by the state. They had to be of the equal social class. And then they would have this ceremony and they would seal it with a kiss. So you know when our contemporary culture would say, you know, at the end, you may kiss the bride. It actually harkens back to ancient Roman times. That was free. You can have that. Use that for trivia. In our contemporary culture, the wedding is an interesting role. Because in both of those other cultures, this friend of the bridegroom, or it would be called the shoshben, which I'll use interchangeably, the shoshben or the friend of the bridegroom, would be a person that would be a servant, a liaison between the two. Kind of like the best man. But in our culture, the best man has a little bit of a different role, don't they? Usually individual with mismatched socks, forgets to order the suit or tuxedo in time, pretends to lose the ring, throws a party the night before, and almost doesn't get the groom there. There was a movie about it, but I didn't see it. There, there's a couple movies that I, I didn't see any of them, but some of my friends may have, may have and told me about it. But in our culture, the role of the best man is more of like a court jester or a jokester. But in the ancient culture, this was an incredibly important role. Because they had four things that they would need to do. And I believe it is something for each one of us and for me that we are called to. And that we get to partner with the groom. We get to prepare the bride. We get to preside over their encounters. And we get to protect the bridal chamber. And so I'd like to show you a different story moving from the Old Testament of what it looks like for this partnership, what it looks like for a shoshben to partner. We go back to the book of Genesis. It's at the beginning of, the, of the, the Old Testament. We move to chapter 24. Sarah has just died, and Abraham says it is time for Isaac to marry. And so Abraham is very old, and he goes to his oldest servant, the one who'd been with him the longest, that he entrusted everything to this person. The scriptures doesn't say that Isaac was entrusted with everything. It says that the servant was entrusted with everything of Abraham's. And he said that Abraham says to him one day, give me your hand. Now, the next thing I'm about to say is going to get a little awkward. He takes the hand of his servant and he places it high up on his inner thigh and says, I am now making a covenant with you. I don't know what was going on in Genesis with the way that they were signs of covenants and things, but it was an awkward time. I'm glad we don't have to do that now. Wouldn't that be an awkward greeting? Or like you're at the bank taking a loan, you're like, well, all right. <laughs> this feels weird for both of us. <laughs> Luckily, we've gone to signatures then, high thigh handshakes. But what Abraham is saying is, I'm making a covenant with you. You've got to promise me this. You promise me that my son, who it's time for him to take a wife, will not marry any of these women from this region, none of these Canaanite women, but that you will go to the land in which I am from, that we are from, and you will find a proper wife for my son. So what Abraham is doing, he's saying, I am asking you now to partner and covenant with me as we have spent all of this time. This is the servant that's been with Abraham the longest. Think for a moment, if you know the story of Abraham, what this servant would have seen. Would he have possibly seen the Lord come to Abraham and said, hey, I know you got nothing and your wife's barren, but I'm going to make you a great name and a great nation. 
Would he have seen the first signs of going into the place that they were promised? Would he have seen the birth of Isaac? Would he have seen the time the Lord says for him to sacrifice Isaac? Would he have seen the angel of the Lord come? This servant had been a trusted, close confidant to Abraham. And he says, now, because you are tested and trusted, I want you to partner with me, covenant with me, to carry out my will for my son. So one of the things that I see in this that I think is incredible for all of us is each and every person in here that is a follower of Jesus the Messiah, or whether you're in the beginnings of the journey, you have the opportunity for the Lord to say, come here, I want you to partner with me. You've seen what I've done. Now partner with me of what I'm going to do. And I want you to be my representative to every place you go. Does that make sense? That it's not just about the Old Testament and the New Testament. That this is something spoken right now. That each and every one of us in this room could be invited to be the Shoshman of Jesus. To partner with him. To be in close relationship. And to carry out his will and his ways. The next thing we see is that the servant is sent and the servant goes. He heads off to the land in which Abraham was from. He takes 10 camels, he takes servants with him, and he takes piled on top of the camels are all of these gifts that are going to be a dowry for the future bride. She's about, like, the future bride of Isaac is about to score. It's about to get amazing. She's like, there's a lot of gifts. He just rolled up here with a whole caravan full of, of things. And Abraham's servant is on his way and he's going. And we get a little glimpse if we read in, in Genesis 24 of what's going on in the servant's head. The servant's like, this is my chance to shine. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. Because I'm about to choose the wife of the promised son of the promised people. She's going to be the mother of a great nation that's as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands at the seashore. No pressure. No pressure. Just don't blow it there, buddy. So he goes and he heads to the well. He gets to this place and he says, Lord, you got to give me a sign because it's going to be more than just like hair color or eyes or who I think is attractive. He's going to go, I need a, a sign. And so this will be the sign, Lord. How about this? Does this sound okay with you? How about if when I ask her for a drink, she says, sure, you can have a drink and she waters the camels. How's that sign? Okay, so you're going to choose the mother of the greatest nation on the fact that she fed your pets. Sure, sure. That sounds about right. And so Abraham go, uh, Abraham's servant goes, and he goes to the well. And there at the well, he sees this beautiful woman coming. He's like, I hope this is it. This could be great. Isaac's going to be stoked. And it's Rebecca. And Rebecca comes up, and he says, may I have a drink? And she says, sure, you can have a drink. And how about I water the camels as well? And he's like, first shot, I got it. This is easy stuff. Who else wants a wife? So he goes and he runs back. And as she's watering the camels, he runs over to the camels and he grabs bracelets and earrings and he begins to shower her with gifts. She's like, wow, sure are friendly around here. And he says, hey, can I stay with your family? Sure, comes back. And her brother Laban, who we'll know later, we'll hear about him but not today, in the story comes out. And this Shoshben, this trusted servant of Abraham, begins to negotiate and say, I've come here to choose a wife for my servant Isaac, the son of Abraham, the one that God promised to be a great name and a great nation. And he begins to tell them about it. And they see the amount of dowry and they say, that sounds about right. That sounds great. And so he begins to prepare as Rebecca says, yes, I'll go back. And as they make the long trek back to Abraham and Isaac, he begins to prepare her for her groom. Now, I'm reading into the text, so forgive me. But I can only imagine that long, long journey back that they had some conversations. Can you imagine it for a moment? Let's try to tune in for a second. They're on the caravan back. And Rebecca is asking about Isaac. Tell me about the man that I'm going to marry. Well, he's the promised son. His parents were really, really old. And they were barren. And they waited for 25 years to have him. 
And then God said he was going to have to be sacrificed. What? Yeah, but the angel of the Lord came. And can you imagine as the servant is beginning to prepare that woman for her future husband? Getting her ready for their encounter to come together. As they get close, it's said that Isaac was out in a field meditating. Sounds really spiritual. He's out in the field. He's meditating. He sees the camels, and he comes up. And Rebecca says, well, who's that fine Jewish man? That's in a nude slang translation. And the servant says, that's Isaac. That's your husband. And he takes her down from the camel, and they go into the tent, and they consummate the marriage. But there's this beautiful piece where the shosh ben goes in partnership to the father, goes and prepares the bride so that they can come together. Really quickly, I just want to give you another glimpse of this. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, it's the only thing I'm going to talk about is John and Genesis today. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, goes to the woman at the well. It's a similar scene, may even have been the same well. Goes there. And as she begins to ask all these things, Jesus begins to step over all of these cultural, social, religious barriers. And begins as if taking off a blindfold off of her eyes so that she can see. Because she said, well, I'll know when the Messiah comes. And so Jesus begins to prepare her so that she can see the Messiah. It's similar of what that Shashbim was doing for Rebecca as he was getting her ready for Isaac. And soon you and I are offered an incredible opportunity and purpose in life to partner with God. And to prepare the bride for their meeting. The next thing that we see is that the Shashman had a very important role in the wedding celebration. The Jews in the ancient culture really knew how to party. When they had a wedding, it was like seven days long. And it was a festival. And they would just party. Our weddings are kind of like, oh, one day, really? Compared to theirs. And at the wedding celebration, there would be food and wine and there would be dancing and there would be celebration there would be different blessings that were spoken over the couple and that would oftentimes happen by the MC, aka the shashpin the shashpin would preside over that ceremony in such a way of making a way so that the two could come together they would set up the hupa the tent that would be over them in which they would come and have uh, the exchanging of, of vows and promises. They would make sure that there was enough food. They would make sure that the chair set up. They would make sure that the place was doing. There was no task too great and no task too small. And the whole goal of the Shashben was to preside over the ceremony. And the people that were to get the attention and the affection was the bride and the groom, never the Shashben. The attention wasn't to go to the Shashben. The tension was to go to the, pe- to, the, to the married couple. And so the Shashman would preside over that ceremony, doing the things that needed to happen so that the two could come together. And so by presiding over a ceremony, basically what they were doing is just making a place where the two could encounter one another. Throughout the New Testament, it talks about the church as the bride of Jesus. And Jesus is the groom to the church. And so I kind of think that every time we gather on a Sunday, or whatever time we gather, it's like a wedding celebration, isn't it? Where the bride and the groom are coming together. And it's really changed things for me, because I've been in pastoral ministry for almost 20 years. And uh, one of the practices that I have is to come on a Saturday night. I did it last night. And I come in, and nobody's here. And I clean up the mess that I made that week. And usually there's cables or there's stuff strewn out because I am known as a mess maker. I have piles of things everywhere. And I'll come in and I'll wrap the cables and I'll get things. And last night I was doing it, I was getting a little, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of cleaning up these cables. I'm tired. And the Lord reminded me of going, hey, Shosh Ben, tomorrow is a wedding celebration where the bride and the groom are going to encounter one another. So you're simply coming in and getting it ready. And it changes the attitude when I begin to look at to say, all right, I'm going to put these chairs away. Okay, I'm going to clean up the music. I'm going to wrap this cable. Because if I don't have that view, I'm going to wrap the cable around the neck of the person that just left it there for the 300th time. 
But instead of just going, you know what? Tomorrow's a celebration. Today's a celebration where the bride and the groom are coming together. Let me get this room ready so that there's no distractions. How many of you have been in a bridal party before? It's a horrible job. You buy an outfit you didn't want. You show up way early, and you're basically like an indentured servant to that person for the weekend. And then they leave, and they celebrate, and you know exactly what has to happen, don't you? See ya. i got to clean up the mess. <laughs> but why do we do it? Out of love for the couple. We do it out of love and service for the couple. To say this was about the two of you encountering one another. This was about all the people gathering and celebrating you. And sure, I'll get there early and I'll wear what you want and I'll do what you want because I've partnered with you. I've prepared the bride. I'm presiding over the ceremony. And now I'll clean up your mess. (laughs) But there's something about that for us. That there's an incredible purpose that when the Lord says to us, whether you are an atomic physicist whether you work at Google, whether you work at wherever, or you stay home, he says to you, hey, want to be my Shoshben? Want to be my friend, the bridegroom? Want to be my Shoshben Katan, my little companion that is in partnership with me, that prepares my bride and presides over little encounters? Do you know that every time you lead a small group, you know who you are? You're the Shoshben of Jesus. Do you know every time you get together with someone for coffee to bring them closer to Jesus, do you know who you are? You're the shoshben, creating spaces for them to encounter the groom. We don't have volunteers at Cornerstone anymore. Can I just say we don't have any more volunteers? But we have shoshben who greet, who work with children and youth and run media and sound and lead worship. A band of shoshben who come together To create a place and a space where the bride and the groom can meet. Does that make sense? And you can do this everywhere and anywhere you are. As you partner, as you prepare, as you preside. One final thing. The Shoshpin would have a very unique role. And at the Jewish wedding celebration, at the festivities, they would party for a long time and then at one point it was time for them for the bride and the groom to consummate the marriage in the Jewish culture they would sign a contract and it may be up to a year to two years before the wedding and at that wedding they would consummate the marriage they would come together sexually for the first time and there was a bridal tent set up and so at some point in the wedding the bride would slip away to the tent the shashben would follow and stand guard at that tent not letting anyone into that tent as the bride was preparing herself for the groom. The only person that could enter there would be the groom. So the shashben stood there guarding the tent, a trusted partner, a trusted friend of the groom, and a trusted person in the vulnerability of the bride. And as the two would... Uh, be intimate and there would be the declaration of her virginity and there would be all of those things that we won't get into that the shashben was there to stand as a witness that the bride was who she said he wa- she was and that the groom was who he says he was and the shashben stood there to say I vouch for this I protect his reputation and I protect her vulnerability this was a courageous role trusted friend and a trusted guard. So for you today, maybe many of you have found your purpose and your significance. But what I would challenge you to do is to say, you know, there's something more than a career. I'd say there's something even more than a vocation. There's a call on each one of our lives. And something for me that has disarmed me from being, do I be a preacher or a singer or do I work at a church or I work at a university or what are all these things? Those are questions we can get to. But something the Lord has spoke to my heart that is, I hope it's coming across because it's absolutely changed me. Is this invitation to be his shoshben. Because it's disarmed that question of I have a purpose. So when I'm setting up a chair or I'm wrapping a cable, or I'm preaching a sermon, or I'm writing a curriculum. I'm the shoshben. That's my job. 
I'm in partnership with God. I'm to prepare the bride. I'm to preside over little encounters, whether that's in my home with my children or here at Cornerstone. And I'm to protect the bride from false loves and declare the reputation of the groom. I invite you to that today. I invite you to be the Shoshban, wherever you are. And I have a question. Actually, I want you to ask a question. <laughs> if something's stirring in you and you say, yeah, I want, you know what, that resonates with me. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to ask Jesus, how have you uniquely positioned and gifted me to be your friend of the bridegroom? Because you being a Shosh Ben looks different than me being a Shosh Ben. But all of us are called to be the Shosh Ben of Jesus, the little companion of Christ. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, please come and, and bring clarity. I bless each person here in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, with open ears, open mind, open eyes, open heart. And now in the presence of the Lord, would you ask Jesus that question? How have you uniquely gifted and positioned me to be your Shoshman? Age doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter. sense or can you hear him say partner with me my friend partner with me my friend my child to carry out my will and my ways in the places I've sent you Can you hear him say, prepare those you come in contact with for an encounter with me. Let them know what I'm like. Can you hear him say, preside over little encounters. Create some space where you can lead those around you to an encounter with me. Can you hear him say, protect my bride from false loves? And let people really know what I'm like.
unfortunate thing over what's just been unfortunate oftentimes that people that work for a church say are called the ministry we're looked at as well they're the ones that are in ministry I'm just part of the bride and one of the things I'd like to do is today is to flip that on its end to say we're all called Regardless, we're all called to be the Shoshben of Jesus. And some of you have been strategically placed in the workforces and the families and the environments and the communities that you're in because he wants you to be his Shoshben right there. And that you've not missed out on your call to ministry. You're actually living it out exactly how he wants you to. You just need to recognize that. So I want to bless you in the name of Jesus in the place that you're at, that you're exactly where he wants you to be. And that you can be his Shoshben anywhere. And you don't even need a title of pastor in front of your name. But you're called to be his companions. I pray now as we close, let's stand together. That our act of worship is not to sing and say things to go and to live this out and the places that he's called us. And so I bless you in the name of Jesus with courage and clarity to go be the Shoshman of Jesus in and through your life. In his precious name, amen. Go in peace.